as Daniele just said. So today we start talking about um, the spectroscopy of neutral excitations, that is when you don't add or remove a particle to the system, but you just, for example, want to measure the probability of exciting an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. In general, as we have seen, one can do a DFT calculation and you get a band gap. You can correct this band gap, for example, with the GW method. But then uh, this does not mean that when you do, for example, an optical absorption experiment, this band gap, the quasi-particle band gap, is the one that you will see. In general, you will see the optical gap. That, in semiconductor, can be at a lower energy than the quasi-particle band gap. And this is due to the fact that the excited uh, electron hole pair, actually the hole and the electron, they interact with each other through the Coulomb interaction. And this uh, lowers, uh, so the energy of the electron hole bound pair is lower with respect to the independent particle ones. So the electron hole interaction is taken into account in the beta salpeter equation, uh, which we'll try to show, to derive, not super rigorously here, using a time dependent approach. So basically, we will concentrate on the response function of the electronic system after it has been excited by an external electric field, like an optical laser. And you see here, its time dependence shows several periods, so several frequencies, like this one is a frequency, this one, and so on. And then when you do the Fourier transform, these frequencies will appear here and form the absorption spectrum. So this is what we want to try to do. Um, more or less, we will do, we will follow this, uh, this scheme, we will go beyond the independent particle picture. We will uh, start with the equation of motion, first from the den for the density matrix and then for the response function. And then we will uh, basically discover the electronal interaction and excitons. Clearly, when we want to talk about excitations, as you know very well, we need uh, an like complete knowledge of the electronic system, a good knowledge of its excitations, and then we can use this excitation to uh, compute theoretical spectroscopy. So you might say, okay, but I know how to compute the optical absorption spectrum of a system because by first order perturbation theory, we know this is the formula, right? It's just a Fermi golden rule that uh, here gives the probability of an excitation of an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, so it gives the optical strength. And the excitations will be at these um, energies, which will be the energies of the single particle electronic transitions. So this is the absorption spectrum, right? The, the problem is, if we take a random material like lithium fluoride, let's do the most accurate uh, calculation you can do so far, DFT plus GW, and let's plot this absorption spectrum. That's completely wrong. So it's the red curve, while experiment shows this huge peak at a lower energy. So clearly here we are missing something. Obviously, we are missing the electron hole interaction. And in order to gain an accurate prediction, we will need to modify this expression in this way. You see here, new quantities in red are appearing. In particular, we are summing over a new set of states, lambda. These are the excitons. And the optical strength is now given by a linear combination of all the single particle transitions weighted by these excitonic weight factors. Furthermore, the peaks in the absorption spectrum will not be in the single particle uh, excitation energies any longer, but they are the exciton energies. So how do we find these red quantities is the topic of this lecture by solving the beta salpeter equation. If we apply this expression for the optical absorption, we obtain a good uh, prediction uh, of the experiment. Actually, electron hole interaction is extremely important if you are interested in uh, layered or 2D systems, like for example here, monolayer boron nitride. If you look at the independent particle absorption, of course it started the quasi-particle band gap, it's here. But if I add the BSE, it's completely different, the optical absorption that I obtain. In particular, absorption starts two electron volts below the quasi-particle band gap. So you see that in low dimensional systems, it's crucial to add uh, excitons, to add the electron hole interaction. You can't do it without, right? Okay, so now we see how to do that. Ah, okay, sorry. I wanted also to say that why this happens, why we have such a large exciton binding energy here. That is because in uh, lower dimensional systems, the electron hole interaction is weakly screened. You see here the field lines between electron and hole are mostly in the vacuum space. There are no electrons more or less here. And so it's 
much like screener, is screened more weakly than you would have in a bulk system. So this is generally the reason. Okay, so to derive the BSC, in general there are various approaches. For example, you can do the Schwinger approach, you use uh, four point quantities, do some functional derivatives, and then arrive uh, at the result. If you have already arrived at the at Dean's pentagon, you can manipulate it, in particular starting with the vertex function, and then you also get the BSC. But uh, today we will follow this other approach, which maybe is a bit uh, simpler to follow, let's say. Uh, it, that is what I mentioned before, following the equation of motion in real time for the response function. So let's uh, start with a description of the ground state electronic system. Here I wrote artifoc. You see this is the Harty function and this is the exchange written in uh, like self-energy style. We don't need to start from these. We can start from uh, Konsham Hamiltonian, Konsham plus GW, but this is just the simplest starting point for the electronic system for us. And uh, so this system gives us the single particle energies and the single particle wave function. So in, a, in an extended system, it will be a block function, uh, which, for example, if this is the Konsham Hamiltonian, we can compute in DFT, right? And the other thing that we have here is the equilibrium density that it's defined like that. And uh, you see at equilibrium, basically, if we expand it in a single particle states, just give us the state occupations. So these uh, F occupation factors that you have also in the Yambo cheat sheet for a semiconductor at zero temperature, they're just zero or one. Nothing very complicated at equilibrium. However, now a uh, laser is coming to the system and it's uh, rearranging a bit this, uh, this uh, density. So the full time dependent Hamiltonian in this case is like this. We have the original uh, non-interacting Hamiltonian, like in this case I wrote Alter Fock. Then we have the external field. And then we have these corrections to the density functionals because since the external field induces a change in the density, also the density functionals will change. So they will be corrected with respect to the ground state ones, the equilibrium ones. Okay. And uh, now we have a time-dependent density matrix that for the same position, Green's function, you can just find it directly from the Green's function. You expand it in single particle states and you obtain this time-dependent uh, version. Perfect. We are not really interested in the density matrix per se. We are interested in the response function. And as you have seen on Monday in the linear response Kubo formula, this is given, basically, this gives the variation of the density matrix with respect to the external field. So this is what we want to compute. This, is, this will contain the electronal interaction. And this can also be expanded in a single particle basis set. It will depend on four single particle indices, as you can see here. And of course, even in this uh, basis set, this uh, functional relation is still valid, right? So we can write it like that. Okay. Now, in order to proceed, we have to introduce the equation of motion for the density matrix. As you see here, it's time evolution. It's given by the commutator with the Hamiltonian. Now, you will hear much more about this tomorrow in the real-time lectures, where there will be a more general version of this equation, a time evolution of the Green's function, which is called the cardinal of bime equation. But for us, this uh, reduced version is the perfect starting point in linear response to arrive to the Betzelpeter. Why? Because if we now apply a functional derivative with respect uh, to the incoming external field, then this becomes uh, um, uh, equation of motion for the response function. And what we have, to, so our objective is to find an expression for this chi. What we have to do is to compute these commutators, compute this derivative, and then hopefully we will be able to compute absorption spectra. So in order to mm, make, it, make this a bit simpler, we start uh, rewriting some parts of this Hamiltonian, in particular these uh, density functionals here. We can expand them first in the external field. So it is also sum over states and so on. And then we can use the chain rule to expand again. And then we transform these into two derivatives, one with respect to the density matrix and one of the density matrix with respect to the external potential. This is useful because this is just the response function, so the quantity that we want. And then we are left uh, with this quantity that we need to kind of uh, assess what it is. 
We can do the same with the FOC part or the self-energy part. And then for the two of them summed, we just obtain this expression. And the part in red will become the kernel of the beta salpeter equation, the one that encodes the electron hole interaction. And now we will just compute these derivatives to get the simple form for this kernel. Let's start with a time-dependent heart rate. As you know, it can be written like this, and then expanded in single particle basis like this. You see here, this is like <laughs> Feynman graph to kind of represent what happens. This line is the Coulomb interaction, and this is the density. You know? So this is a Green's function that starts and ends at the same position. We can expand this density into the, our single particle uh, basis step, and we obtain this. So all the wave functions are here inside this integral. The time-dependent part is outside. We call the big integral V, and we are done. We are happy like that. An observation that I can make now is uh, if we switch this graph to the momentum space, you notice that uh, this uh, Coulomb interaction cannot carry any momentum of itself because of momentum conservation. For example, here an electron is coming. If the Coulomb interaction would take away some of its momentum, then it would carry it here. But since this density must start and then with the same momentum, this is simply not possible for momentum conservation. So this uh, Hartley term will be always at uh, Q equals zero. It will only carry any external momentum of the electron hole pair. And so finally, we can write it like this. So it's quite simpler. Now we can take the derivative with respect to the density. As you see, it's, it has become trivial. And we obtain this expression for the Hartley part. Now, if we stop here, we obtain the RPA screening, basically. It's what Andrea Maini said on Monday, no? time-dependent heart rate gives you the RPA screening. But we have another term here, namely the self-energy, which now I have written it in, uh, in a FOC case, pure exchange. So it's not GW, it's uh, GV, right? So the G can be rearranged as a density matrix that is not diagonal in the position basis, because you see it starts at R and then at R prime. But we can also expand this in a single particle basis set. And we obtain this expression in which now, of course, the N and L indices are exchanged with respect to the Hartree, uh, with the Hartree case. However, here we encounter a problem. Because in general, we would like to start from a single particle description that is the most accurate possible. Namely, we would like to start from DFT plus GW, right? Very good, but here, if we take just the exchange self-energy, the interaction between electron and hole will be unscreened, will be bare. And this cannot be right, no, because we are excluding the rest of the system. And then the binding between electron and hole will be much larger, much stronger than it should be in a real system with a charge density. So what we can do at this point, we replace this V with a screened interaction. So as you know from yesterday, the screen interaction can be computed with, first you do the RPA screening, screens the Coulomb, then we put it here. Now this self-energy just becomes the, basically the exchange correlation self-energy of yesterday, but evaluated at zero frequency, so it's a static. And in fact, it's called a static ex uh, screened exchange, sorry, so no correlation anymore, because the screening is static here. So of course, uh, what does it mean that the screening is static? It means that... Uh, when you create an excitation, an electron hole pair, the rest of the system instantaneously adjusts to this excitation to screen it. In reality, there is a time delay for these adjustments. We are neglecting all the effects that might come from the dynamical part of this screen interaction, so from its time dependence. But you will see this is needed um, to arrive at a workable form for the BSC. Okay, so now that we did this, we can, ah, sorry, ah, I also wanted to say, at variance with the case, uh, with the Hartley case, here the screen interaction can carry its own momentum. So this will result in an additional integral over momenta in Fourier space. So now we simplified the screen exchange, time dependent screen exchange in this way. And we want to take the functional derivative with respect to the density matrix. The problem is now we, okay, we need to derive this part, but also this part, because now W itself depends on the Green's function and on the density. But we just neglect this derivative here because it will lead us to higher order terms in W. So, so far we neglect it. And then we also obtain a simple form for the self-energy part. We go back now to the equation of motion. 
with these simplifications that basically becomes like this. So we have three commutators that we need uh, to calculate, basically. Um, and here you see you have this W minus 2V that appears. Okay, so now we need to compute them, but we can do it. For example, the first part, the A, we can just let the Hamiltonian, the, like the equilibrium Hamiltonian act on the eigenstates and you obtain the difference of energies. For the second commutator, we replace the time dependent density matrix with the equilibrium one because we want to stay at first order in the external interaction. Since the uh, row of t depends on the external interaction, we will not be at first order any longer, so we use the um, equilibrium one. And the equilibrium one uh, applied to the eigenstates just gives a difference of occupation factors. Again, in a semiconductor at zero temperature, this is basically one or minus one, not uh, anything fancy. Okay. And then the third term, the large one, actually goes exactly like this. So it's not a difficult commutator, analogous to B. And then we obtain this equation after we also perform the derivative with respect to the uh, external potential. Here, okay, I just emphasize that actually the response function depends only on the differences of the two times. So the time when you, we have the probability of creating the electronal pair and when the time when we have the probability of it to recombine back to the ground state. And here this k is the kernel. I just called the w minus uh, vk, just for simplicity. And now we can simplify it even more. You see all these uh, quantities depend, for example, the kernel depends on four single particle indices. Ah, sorry, yeah. Obviously, the w plays the role of, the, uh, of an attractive interaction between electron and holes. So it's, what, it's the binding term, it's what creates the bound uh, excitons, bound exciton. While this is a repulsive contribution, okay? Now, we can simplify this equation even more. So we have, when we have an electronic transition, for example, we can imagine it is uh, the N1 state is in the valence band, and then the, uh, the N2 state is in the conduction band. It can be also the opposite, a transition from conduction to valence. In general, we can label a transition with a single index kappa, and we go in the transition basis. This actually simplifies uh, a bit how this equation appears. And now it is clear that uh, we can easily take the Fourier transform because we have just the time derivative here and the chi to, to be Fourier transformed. So we do it, and in Fourier space we have this simple expression. Now it's time to, to basically we are almost at the end. Notice that uh, if we set the kernel to zero, which means if we set the electronal interaction to zero, then this equation reduces to the, must reduce to the independent particle response function, which indeed we get, and notice that it's diagonal in the transition basis. The only non-diagonal term, the one that mixes different electronic transitions, is the interaction term, of course. Okay, so now that we recognize the independent particle chi naught, we can just rearrange this equation into a Dyson-like equation for the chi. And this is like the pictorial representation. So this is the point of connection of this real-time approach with other approaches like Dean, Schwinger, and so on. Because in those approaches, you would start at a higher level with a time order two particle grains function. And then you would arrive at a Dyson-like equation for that function. And then you would reduce it to a retarded response function, which is what we have here. So this is the point of contact. Of course, this kernel, we can uh, divide it in this way, no? W, the attractive term, and V, the repulsive term. Okay. Now, okay, we arrived at this equation, but still we don't know what is chi. So we didn't really solve it, right? We just uh, reworked it. But now we can solve it. We just bring everything to the left, like this. And then we recognize, if we isolate omega, that this really looks like the matrix element of an Hamiltonian, in particular, when a matrix element of an effective two-particle Hamiltonian, that we just define it like that, no? And now, we can invert it. So, we start from this, in matrix form, we invert this equation, and we obtain chi equals to something. You see, it is chi equals to one over omega minus Hamiltonian, so this is, can have the form of a three-particle propagator for the excitons provided that we are going to diagonalize this Hamiltonian, which we can do. And 
we obtain exactly the quantities that we will need later for absorption. The eigenvalues are the exciton energies, that is the energies of the electron hole bound pairs. And then from the eigenstates, we obtain the exciton coefficients that act as weights in the linear combination of single particle transitions in the optical strength of the absorption spectrum. Um, now, of course, the response function can also be written in this basis, the excitonic basis, because we have diagonalized it, so we can use uh, the spectral representation of this Hamiltonian, and we obtain this. And then, if we want to express it in the transition basis, which is what we have, starting from a single particle uh, picture, then it will just be like this. So remember that this just gives us, it's just the response function, it's the variation of the density matrix with respect to the external field. Now, here, actually, I took a shortcut because I didn't say that this matrix is Hermitian. And so there might be problems. In fact, here I am restricting the possible transitions to positive energy transitions that one can go from the valence band to the conduction band. This Hamiltonian is much more general than that. can also account for negative energy transitions. In this case, it's not really Hermitian in general. More likely, it's a pseudo-Hermitian which means that the eigenvalues are still real. But uh, the eigenvectors might not be orthogonal, but this is a problem that can be accounted for uh, with an overlap matrix. You will see a much more detailed description of uh, this uh, in the next lecture by Maurizia, which she will go into details about this thing. Uh, but for us, this is already enough. What we did, basically, we rewrote the problem of this uh, correlated propagation of electron and holes as a effective two-particle Hamiltonian to be diagonalized by the code. This two-particle Hamiltonian contains this off-diagonal term in the transition basis, which is the kernel, and this kernel encodes the electron hole interaction with, uh, I repeat, a screen interaction term which is attractive and responsible for the binding of electron and hole. And this comes from the self-energy in a single particle picture, in particular for the exchange correlation self-energy in a static approximation. And this term, which is repulsive, and this comes from the heart functional in the single particle picture. What do we need to diagonalize this Hamiltonian? What are the starting ingredients? Oops. We need uh, some quasi-particle energies, the best that we can get, maybe, so DFT plus GW. Some single particles wave functions, so let's say DFT. And then, of course, for the W, we need to compute the static electronic screening, so static RPA. But these you did already in the tutorials with the AMBO. So uh, when we have this, we have this, we diagonalize, we get the excitons. So just to recap, we notice that the independent particle picture fails to reproduce optical absorption in many semiconductors due to the lack of electronal interaction. But we can account for the electronal interaction if you consider the dynamics of the excited system. We consider these dynamics using the equation of motion for the response function, which we rework into, we recast into an effective two-particle Hamiltonian, and this finally yields us the correct quantity, the most accurate quantities for optical absorption. But now we have switched from the independent particle picture to the exciton picture. So that's it. There is no more. I just leave you with this uh, painfully detailed uh, uh, graph representation of the Bethesda-Peter equation. So here you see you have all the indices, the state index, k-point index, you have the sums of the g-vectors for the plane wave basis, and so on. So you can maybe go on the Yambo wiki, take these, and then maybe compare with the expression that you find in the Yambo cheat sheet, if you are interested in how maybe one can really use diagrams for doing calculations. Thank you.